Well, hello and welcome to the Stapleford Parish Midweek Online with me, Peter Huxtable, uh, standing in the Annex Corridor here and just an invite to come and join me in St Helen's Church today. So here we are, and uh, just standing in the place where yesterday we had our Tuesday service, and as part of that uh, I gave a talk on how does God answer our prayers? It was the sort of under the headline theme from Nehemiah chapter 2. So in a minute, um, please do stay with this and listen to me try and explain a little bit about how God comes to us, challenges us, and guides us as he answers our prayers today. Uh, but first of all, let's join in the song, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. And it starts at verse 1 and goes on to verse 10. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. 
I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so he will give me the timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus, lead us to the Father by your Spirit. Help us draw near. Jesus, lead us to the Father by your Spirit. Help us draw near. Jesus, lead us to the Father by your Spirit. Help us draw near. Jesus, lead us to the Father spirit help us draw near Jesus lead us to the Father by your spirit help us draw Well, um, for us, the main question on my lips coming to this talk is, how does God answer our prayers? How does God answer our prayers? It's obviously a bit of a mystery a lot of the time, but there are some really important truths in this Nehemiah story uh, and the bit that we're covering today. Today for Nehemiah is crunch time. He finally gets a moment with the king the Persian king of this whole region in the Middle East. Will he pluck up the courage to put his case about the broken down walls and gates of Jerusalem to the king? And then what follows in these verses is a bit of a lesson in how God answers prayer. Because, I don't know about you, you can hear Jesus' promise to us sort of in the Sermon on the Mount, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. And we can take that to mean that, well, we can ask for something and God will do it for us. We can ask for a reduction in crime in Stapleford and we expect God to sort it. We ask for a less stressful home life 
And we want God to make it happen. We pray for a reduction in coronavirus levels and we want him to intervene. Well, the message from Nehemiah is that God doesn't just hand it to us, but when we follow his path and stay alert and obedient, we are actually in line to receive far more that we can ask or imagine. So the good news is that there's loads that God wants to give us. The challenge is how we go about receiving it. Well, um, there's a bit of a pathway that Nehemiah has to go on here. First of all, as we know in chapter one, he's hit by a massive issue uh, that deeply affects him. So we hear about him being in a state of mourning, in a state of loss and helplessness and regret. That's often what happens to us, isn't it? When we hear something that's far too big for us to cope with, we're sort of left reeling. And it talks about the timescales involved. He hears about the news in the month of Kislev, which is um, four months earlier than the month of Nisan, which is the one that we're in for this bit of the reading. So Nehemiah spent four months, um, first of all, hearing the news and then digesting it and then turning it into a period of mourning and fasting and praying. And during those four months, it's like he's sort of owning the problem. He he's, he's, doesn't know how to sort it to start with, but he's, it's, it's affected him deeply enough to spend the time praying and searching God and uh, feeling a little bit of ownership that, oh, come on, there must be something that can be done about this. And uh, question for all of us, question for you. What are the sort of issues that affect you in this way? Are you someone that allows things to move you and unsettle you? This is often the key as to what you should be focusing on in prayer. If something's a bit unsettling and a bit daunting, rather than just burying it and ignoring it, actually receive those feelings. Be in tune with how it makes you feel inside. And that is the beginning of asking God to um, offering it to God in prayer and asking God what your own part in it is, even if it's rather daunting. So Nehemiah had this period, and then the month of Nisan is not only four months after the month of Kislev, it's also the new year for the Jewish new year. It's the first month. So it's like he, opened, he turns over the new leaf in the calendar and says, right, God, it's, this is the year. It's gonna, it, we've got to do something about it now. You see on the journey he's been on. And he realises, he looks at his rotor, uh, and on the rotor he sees his name beside a date in the month of Nisan, where he is going to be taking the wine to the king. So at that moment, there's like a sort of, uh, you know, um, a moment of realisation that this is the strategic moment to take advantage of this moment. Uh, and uh, that's when Nehemiah then speaks out this prayer in chapter one, this dedicated and specific prayer to say, Lord, grant me success today in the presence of the king. So again, a question for all of us, on the, if we're asking and seeking and knocking, when we pray, do we actually get to the point of specifically really naming something that we want God to do? Do you remember Jesus challenging the blind man saying, what is it you want me to do for you? And the blind man spelt it out, Lord, I want to see right now. <laughs> what are we desperate for God to do? What do we name um, God to do in front of him? That's when it starts getting serious and, and we're starting to engage with God in prayer rather than just the sort of general sweep of things. It involves us in the act of praying. And so we get to this scary moment of no return in the presence of the king where Nehemiah has decided, well, I can't cover anything up. I am, you know, I'm going to go into the king's presence. I can't hide the fact that I'm completely, my life is just completely in, being rocked by this news. Uh, and uh, so he doesn't try and tart himself up or he just, nor does he try and sort of play being sad. He, he just genuinely, this is how he is. This is the season of the life that he's in. This has shaped him, this news. He's not putting it on. And so the king notices that. And Nehemiah goes into the, his presence. He's alert for the opportunity to try and speak to the king. 
And so he offers this arrow prayer to God. Did you notice it? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and then I spoke. So it's like um, the, the moment comes and after all that four months worth of prayer comes the little arrow prayer, which, you know, fire it up quickly to God before he opens his mouth. And that's probably an experience for lots of us as well. Whenever we're in those sort of moments, don't forget the arrow prayers. Don't forget, God, give me glory in what I'm about to say before we say it. And it really helps. Uh, to, to, it really helps. Well, God opened the door at this moment because the king initiated the conversation. Did you see that? After all this big build-up, it's the king that says, why are you looking so sad? It must be more than just um, illness. It must be sadness of the heart. And in that moment, God opened the door for Nehemiah to be able to splurge out what it was that was on his mind. Um, and as a result, not only did he manage just to say, well, you know, could I just maybe go off for a little bit by myself to back to Jerusalem and um, just see what the problem is? Actually, Nehemiah then starts getting bolder and bolder in what he asks for. He says, can I go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? Well, that's quite a big, bold statement. Oh, by the way, can I have some letters, please? Um, and, oh, could I have the old forest as well? Could I get in touch with Asaph to, to have some timber? Um, and then, so it's like... This door that God has opened and Nehemiah has walked through by faith leads to God answering this prayer in a much more lavish way than could ever be imagined. He does get his letters, he gets his forest, plus he gets officers and cavalry that the king throws in for good measure. And suddenly Nehemiah is equipped to go properly to Jerusalem to, um, with more than he needs to begin to address the problem. In the process of this journey of prayer that Nehemiah has gone on, it stirs up greater resistance. There are bigger challenges ahead, not only the challenge of building the walls, but it stirred up the resentment of the local leaders in Judea, uh, Sanballat and Tobiah. And we hear a lot more about them in Nehemiah in the coming chapters. And what's Nehemiah's response in verse 8 and in verse 18 later next week? is that phrase, the gracious hand of my God was upon me. What a beautiful thing to say. That, that should be very close to the, the, our testimony. Uh, whenever God hears and answers our prayer and leads us into a new view and, and, and helps us and strengthens us in this way, we should be quick to tell people, well, the gracious hand of my God was upon me as I am. Um, as I went with fear and trepidation into that job interview or, or wherever it was that we were, you were praying for. Um, so in that little story there, this is the way that Jesus opens the door for us. We have to really want something genuine in response to being touched. We have to pray so that it affects us personally rather than like a sort of slot machine where we put a thing in the slot and expect God to sort it out and we remain unaffected. No, the door opens, Jesus does open the door, but we have to walk through it. Um, we have to walk through it by faith and be prepared to be personally involved in the answer to the prayer that we're praying. And then when we are like that, there's more than enough resources. All those resources are there we just have to be bold enough to step forward and ask with an act of faith. And it's quite possible, of course, in the process, like it was for Nehemiah, that when we pray like that, life will never be the same afterwards. We can never go back. We've gone past the point of no return. And on we go in the adventure with God. At the moment, we are in a time of between, I would suggest, Kislev and Nisan. We are in a time of mourning, aren't we, about the coronavirus. It's hit us hard. It's rocked us. Um, what is touching you about this? What is it that's rocked you about the whole thing? That's the thing that, if you like, to take away from today. Go, to, um, go home and think, Lord, what is it that really affects me about this? And then turn that into a time of prayer. And then think, what are you specifically asking God for? And then after that sort of time, be prepared when the door opens to walk forward with courage and expect God to be giving you more than you will ever need to follow Jesus through the door and into being part of the answer to prayer. 
So we are called, we are equipped, and with renewed faith and courage, we can make the difference that God has stirred us up to make, even in these difficult times, as we follow the footsteps of Nehemiah. Amen. Well, thank you very much for watching that. Uh, just to explain a little bit about the, um, what's going on in the life of the church following the government guidelines. Um, well, first of all, not a lot has changed in terms of what we are allowed to do, which is good. We are still allowed to worship on uh, Tuesdays and Sundays in the way that we've arranged it. There are still provisions for us to be able to meet safely in different groups uh, on our site, either in the Annex or at St Luke's or in church or in the church hall. Um, so if you're considering a small group uh, meeting there, please do talk to me and we can arrange to, for you to do that safely uh, in the right protocols. Uh, and also we mentioned the Harvest Festival. Uh, we still really want to do that on the 27th of September. We will no longer be doing that outside. Uh, obviously we're not really encouraging people to gather in groups of more than six, certainly not in the open air or in large numbers. So we'll stick to the Harvest Festival services inside on the Sunday services times. But we will also be uh, advertising ways that people can come and bring food whether or not you're coming to the church service and make that a safe thing to do. So please do listen out for the um, ways that we'll um, uh, encourage people to bring food over the next couple of weeks but the 27th of September is still the Harvest Festival day for that. So we're going to now close with a final prayer and uh, let's uh, just pause for a moment, be still, bring to God everything that is on your heart at this time and as I was saying in the talk, pray to God to stir your heart with something that really matters to you at the moment. Lord, we lift up those things that are troubling us, that seem too big, that seem too difficult to deal with. Please stir our hearts. Please help us to feel what you feel about the sadness of some situations, about the difficulties and the problems that there are. Lord, help us, teach us how to pray for these things. Teach us how to be motivated and involved and invested in the answers to these prayer. Teach us, Lord, how to ask and to seek and to knock. And Lord, when you do answer, for us to be bold, to walk through the door, to take hold by faith of what you're calling us to do as part of the answer to these prayers. Lord, bless us and keep us, we pray. And thank you for your faithfulness and love. Amen. Well, it's bye from me, and thank you very much for joining in today.